So, conference report recently shot a video that was on Gateway Concepts again, but just in a passing reference, he brought up some people, uh, James Kars and Martin Buber and Paul Tillich. And I wanted to say just a couple of things, just to follow this up really briefly. Largely because I just was at Purdue's graduate student conference and was presenting there, and I had a chance to go meet with my graduate mentor, one of my really beloved professors, Professor Calvin Schrag, who was Paul Tillich's graduate student. It was interesting because I talked with him for a little while, and he has a book called God is Otherwise Than Being, and it's toward a semantics of the gift. And it's to get at what could be called the gift character of existence. And I think this question of what is salvageable for God talk in a modern atheistic scientific world, what can a, a scientifically minded, fully on board with evolution and wants to avoid all the, you know, the, the smoke and the mirrors and the fantastical ridiculousness, but still keep open some of the larger questions. And I was talking with him about history of communication technologies and was asking him about this question of can people forgive the mystery for self-awareness despite finitude and, and some of these problems that I've shot a lot of videos on. He said one of the more interesting things that I wanted to share with people. Um, so I said to him that it seems as if many people, they're unable to, I guess, they're unable to accept death. They've separated death from life. They imagine that you can have life without death. And they bid for a life eternal, which amounts to rejecting the gift that life is. That if life is a gift, we need to accept the wholeness of the gift. And it's very arrogant and presumptuous to assume that we could have this gift and then more as well, and which is really kind of a rejection of the gift. And he thought that, you know, that was okay. He wasn't disagreeing with it, but his account of it was so different. He said, yeah, uh, his response about why people want the afterlife, it's because they don't want to feel indebted. Yeah, I mean, it almost made me cry. I swear to God, I'm, I'm going to cry right now. It's, that's what he said that people want to believe in the notion of an afterlife. They want to believe in a personal afterlife because that's the only way that they can keep the context that would make it all about them and as if they're entitled to all of this. But the more that they realize that it is a gift and it's a gift beyond all repayment, you could never, ever repay that is the very gift that is your life, that you are, that all of the experiences you've had, for good or ill, for good or ill. It's amazing to think of the utter unrepayableness of the gift and how some people stab that off. They, they quell the intensity of what that really means, of life's utter unrepayability. And the way that they keep the, that fr this sort of the way that they keep that out of their view is to imagine that there's a bargain and a covenant, and they can now work some finagle deal out to to get an afterlife and stuff. I mean, all of it. You know, life is a gift beyond any repayment, and death is, in the end, the last word. People need the courage to accept the robust mystery that all of life is. Um, I think there is something very interesting in the suggestion that there are many kinds of monotheism, many kinds of polytheism, many kinds of belief in the divine, and people can argue about what they mean to divine and what, what God would mean or wouldn't mean. But once we really get to what one means by a full-on atheism, and by that, that I mean, person says, there's absolutely no mystery at all. It's all, see, at a certain point, it either doesn't make any sense, or you end up saying, I think as Fred does, this is, it's a dead-end concept. It's, you're showing that humans are not 
literal animals. We're art. We're, we're singing, dancing, pantomiming apes who have evolved in the capacity to tell it like it isn't. And we dwell in those worlds that are sort of calling back from the future possibilities of how we might talk about things. I think to, to see the mean-spirited literalism that uh, is in the dogmatic religions that, that we hear, you know, the creation stuff and all this very dogmatic literalism that is in uh, Christian thought, but it's being replaced by a new kind of literalism, which is reductive evolutionary explanation of things, as if knowing one's evolutionary history will be able to solve, I guess, or address all of the questions that we can have about the meaning of life, the meaning of death. Uh, is there a life after this one? <laughs> I don't know. There doesn't seem to be any evidence. There doesn't seem to be any evidence other than when you die, you die. And that's sort of why I think when, you know, it seems like, and it's not true, but it sort of seems like fantastically the universe began with your birth, uh, all that you've ever known is this life that you're participating in. And it just seems like, I don't know, there doesn't, there's not a giver, not like a fella there who made something and gave it, but how else would you describe life? if not as a gift beyond all repayment. I think that's an agony that people don't want to admit. I think there are just as much religious people wanting to deny that by an appeal to an afterlife. It's the way that they stab off the unrepayability of it. They think it can be a bargain or something negotiated or something within their own terms or somehow leveled down to their own... Uh, I guess, means of encountering or interacting with it. Or you just do the sort of dogmatic scientific reductionism and you say, well, there's no gift there at all. There is no gift. Uh, there's no, because there's no giver, properly speaking, uh, even though there is someone to receive the gift, whatever that would mean, uh, I think there are people who are caught in literalism.